Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to the Synth Suffrage Symposium um, at the hosted by uh, the Caroline Marshall Drawn Center for the Arts and Humanities at Auburn University. Um, my name is Melissa Blair. I'm an associate uh, professor of history at Auburn, and so I, I sort of put this together um, with a lot of help from Bianca Rowlett at uh, University of South Carolina Sumter, who was my co-organizer, and Maben Beard at uh, at Pebble Hill at the Drawn Center. Um, so I'm gonna be moderating our first session. What I wanna do is I'm gonna introduce everybody that you can see on the screen um, and then we'll get started. Um, so our first uh, presenter today is Lauren McIver Thompson. She is a lecturer in history at, at Georgia State University Perimeter and a faculty fellow at the Center for Law, Health and Society at the Georgia State College of Law. Um, our second presenter is Mona Morgan Collins. She is an assistant professor of quantitative comparative politics at Durham University in Durham, England. So it's the middle of the afternoon for Mona. Um, we, appreciate, we appreciate her being here in the middle of the day and not first thing in the morning with the rest of us. And then our third presentation uh, this, in this morning's session will be from Ali Yanis, who is an associate professor of political science at High Point University and Adam Chamberlain, who is Associate Professor of Politics at Coastal Carolina University and also the department chair um, because he doesn't have enough going on apparently. Um, he needs to actually be a political scientist today. Um, so without further ado, um, Mabin behind the scenes will work her magic and make the rest of us go away except Lauren. Um, and Lauren will kick us off. Thank you all very much for being here. Thank you. Okay, I am hoping that my screen is sharing and maybe somebody can let me know. Yes, okay, it looks like it is because I'm looking at my other monitor. <laughs> okay, so please let me know if at any time these slides go away, um, but I will go ahead and get started so that I leave plenty of time for the panel, my other co-panelists. So thank you all for being here today and thank you um, to the Drawn Center at Auburn University and to Melissa Blair and to Bianca Rowlett for organizing this fantastic symposium. And thanks especially, especially to Maven Beard for helping us all with the technology um, because uh, that I was a little nervous about that part. So um, it's going great so far, so thank you. So I'm excited to be speaking uh, to you all today about a link that we often don't sort of overtly think about um, between the suffrage movement and the early birth control movement. Um, and the kind of uh, the newer scholarship today is beginning to connect these things. So I'm gonna talk about that. Um, many suffragists did eventually uh, support the birth control movement, although many did not. And, and today I'm gonna talk about some of those reasons. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started because I wanna be mindful of the time. So um, alongside the question of uh, working for black women's ro voting rights, perhaps no other topic would divide um, the mainstream white suffrage movement um, in the early 20th century than the birth control question. Um, so the kinds of questions they were asking, should suffragists openly support and work to legalize birth control? To what extent should the platforms of suffrage organizations um, incorporate birth control? And the answer from many of these leaders, including Carrie Chapman Catt and Alice Paul was a flat no. Um, because even as suffrage and women's rights organizations work to change laws um, that were, were certainly related to birth control, um, you know, laws governing marriage, divorce, custody, labor, um, birth control ultimately was not part of these um, other agendas. And this isn't necessarily a surprise, um, especially given the suffrage movement's kind of longstanding uh, commitment to respectability politics and keeping any sort of um, radical or unsavory association um, you know, out of the fight for the vote. Um, but it's worth unpacking the history of suffrage's involvement or lack thereof in uh, the birth control movement to better comprehend how contraception would become so entangled in eugenics and its most notorious practice, sterilization. Um, so my research shows that both the early suffrage and birth control movements shared a commitment um, to elevate white supremacy 
um, and they develop similar agendas along these lines in order to de-emphasize the more um, sort of radical underlying framing of their causes, um, which was, of course, women's political and physical rights. So, of course, many in the women's rights movement had long pointed out that the woman question, um, you often hear that kind of uh, that phrasing um, in all kinds of texts um, dating from uh, the early 19th century. Um, it did not just include suffrage, but also marriage and reproductive rights. In fact, the rhetoric of modern modern birth control has its earliest uh, roots in the text of 18th century republicanism and political revolution. So revolutionary era women uh, like Esther DeBert Reed and Mary Wollstonecraft, they would openly link natural rights, political rights to the rights within marriage and women's rights over their own bodies. So in the early Republic and during the antebellum period, utopian reformers like Fanny Wright and also early suffragists like Lucy Stone would continue these arguments and they would argue that sexual reform was in fact an incredibly necessary component for women's rights as a whole. So by the 1880s, as um, the sort of post-war uh, suffrage movement um, is trying to find itself again, um, this sentiment is going to continue to be expressed even more clearly. And there was um, one woman uh, attorney, actually, who was working also for suffrage named Margaret Pierce. And she was a member of the Equity Club, a sort of informal club for the first uh, licensed female lawyers in the United States. She expressed to a group of her fellow attorneys that sometimes I feel there is no question so sacredly important to women as the choice of motherhood and that the ballot even will be worth but little to her. Uh, so they were from the beginning talking about how the vote was not necessarily enough. So it's also important to note that uh, these kinds of sentiments would uh, cross the political spectrum from women who were focused on a variety of agendas. And so these activists would use a few different terms uh, to refer to, win to women's dominion over their own bodies. So proponents of voluntary motherhood were against the use of contraception, and I'll say more about that in just a minute. But they demanded that women choose when, where, and with whom they would have children uh, within marriage, which was quite a radical notion for the era. Um, and you see many suffragists talking about voluntary motherhood in their texts. Uh, social purity, uh, which grew out of other antebellum reform movements, including um, abolitionism and temperance and utopian thought, um, they called the social purity reformers called for confining sex to marriage and they urged women to work toward enforcing men to utilize sexual self-control with their wives. And reformers active in the social purity movement also generally kind of supported the idea of voluntary motherhood. They um, also, though, were working to eliminate, eliminate prostitution. Um, they wanted to uh, raise the age of sexual consent and they wanted to moderate sexual excess in all forms. Um, and as the famous uh, purity reformer and temperance uh, advocate Francis Willard would put it, and this is a little bit surprising coming from somebody like Willard, but nevertheless, she noted um, in an essay uh, for one of the women's rights newspapers that the greatest triumph of Christianity was still marriage, um, but yet uh, the most um, important reform of all would for, would uh, to have women uh, have undoubted custody of herself and for her to determine the frequency of love with a capital L, meaning sex. Um, so Willard in this essay also referenced the outlawing of birth control and abortion in all states in this period, explaining my library groans under accumulations of books written by men to teach women the immeasurable iniquity of arresting development in the genesis of new life. But not one of these volumes contains the remotest suggestion that this responsibility should at least be equally divided be between himself and herself. So free love was the third term. And this was another this was another term used by reformers in this period to refer to the kind of uh, bodily freedom and individual personhood that promised to make women um, equal to men. And it, it opposed the idea of um, coercion in sexual relationships and advocated basically a woman's right uh, to do to determine the uses of her own body, um, promoting women's free sexual choice as a core tenet of equality. Um, yet it's important to note um, that similar to uh, 
folks who advocated voluntary motherhood or social purity that their free lovers critique of marriage and the sexual social order, um, it held resonance for a lot of women who were active in the broader women's rights movement um, because they recognized that sex for women quite simply was a dangerous prospect in this period. Um, marital rape law does not exist um, and the health ri risks of course of pregnancy and child, childbirth were manifold. So together, um, the voluntary motherhood movement, social purity and free love represented a way for women who um, shared different political views and opinions um, across the spectrum to, to still be able to wrest control of sex and their bodies away from this kind of patriarchal status quo that gave men you know, unlimited power over women's bodies. Um, but it's not surprising that um, really, none of these folks were openly supporting legal contraception. Some were, um, but most were not, uh, because in their opinion, legal and efficient birth control um, would have basically benefited only men in this period. If the if the system is patriarchal and men have the ultimate control over literally every aspect of women's lives, um, birth control is something that can be weaponized against them. Um, so it would not uh, it would not have increased women's freedom, and that was their argument. It would only increase men's. So um, behind sort of the the background to all this, the popularity of eugenic and evolutionary thought, um, and in eugenics in the late nineteenth century meant something different um, to most people than what it would eventually mean beginning in the nineteen twenty s also linked uh, the idea of gender and the idea of sexual choice and women's rights together. Um, so eugenics and evolutionary thought are percolating in the background behind uh, these other ideas of free love and voluntary motherhood and so forth. So both ev evolution, evolutionary and eugenic thought centered around the problem of improving the human race and birthing better babies. So in the suffrage movement, um, evolution and eugenics did help to transform arguments about marriage because it allowed reformers to make the case that emancipating women and giving them the vote would make the best evolutionary sense for the human race as a whole. So there are women in the suffrage movement who are talking about heredity, breeding, eugenics, evolution, um, and making those kind of scientific arguments to argue for uh, suffrage. And so they're not, um, it's not that they're dismissing birth control altogether, they are thinking about it. So given these ideological strands animating the larger women's movement, uh, one might imagine that birth control, the birth control movement and the suffrage movement in the early 20th century would have been natural bedfellows, so to speak, um, for lack of a better term. But it was no secret that suffragists really wanted to directly keep, uh, quote unquote, questions of the body um, out of the fight for the vote and focus their rhetoric on safer, more traditional appeals. And so um, as the birth control historian Carol McCann has, fra has phrased it, women's suffrage was meant to extend women's traditional authority and not abandon it. So um, that is the perspective that they are coming from when it comes to birth control. In fact, in 1914, the president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association or NASA, Carrie Chapman Cat took to the New York Times to declare in an editorial that feminism and the suffrage movement had nothing to do with abolishing marriage or uh, its more radical ideas of free love and birth control. She wrote that the suffrage movement has no other plank in its pl uh, platform other than votes for women. It has never been connected with free love. Free love is not and never has been a tenet of suffragists. Um, and if suffragists have a common aim along the lines of morals, it is towards self-control in private life, stricter laws for the control of public vice and the enforcement of those laws. So um, she was writing this kind of very forcefully, but it wasn't quite true because of course many suffragists um, were active um, in speaking and thinking and writing about free love um, earlier in the 20th and the late 19th centuries. Um, but nevertheless, that was the public stand um, that she took. Um, she also wrote um, in 1920 to Margaret Sanger, as Sanger was asking her um, to publicly support birth control, that she felt the cause of birth control was simply too narrow, too sordid, um, and that there was no way that uh, the suffrage movement um, as it was would be able to openly support that. 
Um, and it may be surprising to learn that uh, the, the rejection of birth control extends to even more the, the politically more radical wing of uh, the women's movement even after the 19th Amendment was ratified. So the National Women's Party headed by Alice Paul refuses to allow birth control to become part of um, the organization's new equal rights agenda in 1921. And uh, though Mary Ware Dennett, um, who was a birth control reformer alongside Margaret Sanger, she was also a former suffragist, um, having served as the literature coordinator for NASA uh, previously. And she and Sanger both were given five minutes to address the resolutions committee during uh, one of their meetings. Um, birth control would never be included in the main program. And Alice Paul would defend this choice by saying that um, this, is, this is a strategy uh, choice. It, um, we need to make sure that we define our platform pretty narrowly, kind of a single single issue focus, um, you know, on the Equal Rights Amendment and labor rights. Um, and we're gonna be doing this so that we have maximum impact um, in the aftermath of the passage of, of uh, the 19th Amendment. Um, the birth control movement nevertheless does uh, continue uh, excuse me, let me stay on this slide for just one second. The, um, they continue to kind of doggedly try to convince the, the National Women's Party to include birth control in their program. Um, and uh, it's really to no avail. They continue to fight this well into the 1920s. And in fact, a 1927 editorial pictured here in the slide um, in their equal rights newspaper, the NWP explains that they already have a firm stance on equal rights within the marriage relation. And um, they, they explain, you know, this connotes the right of the wife equally with the husband to determine the number of children they'll have. And until women have uh, both in the law and in their own psychology an equal headship of the family with their husbands, women cannot exercise the right of birth control even when they believe in it and desire it. So there we're hearing echoes of kind of that older argument that was used by um, women's rights advocates in the 19th century to argue that birth control in the end does nothing if when you live in such a, a patriarchal society. So again, scholars who have looked at this have sort of agreed that the, the NWP's uh, kind of single-minded focus on the Equal Rights Amendment and their, or their the organization's general focus on sort of liberal individualism and framing uh, women's equality through politics and employment, uh, this is not actually that surprising. What about the League of Women Voters, which was sort of the other major national organization working for women's rights uh, in this period and after the passage of the 19th Amendment? Um, unlike the National Women's Party, the League of Women Voters actually did seriously consider um, including birth control as a part of its broader agenda. So in April of 1921, at their national convention held in Cleveland, uh, delegates were invited uh, to hear uh, the Voluntary Parenthood Director, Mary Ware Dennett, um, her lecture titled, uh, Children by Chance or by Choice? And there was loud applause. Um, and after the reading of the resolution proposed to support voluntary parenthood, people were standing up and clapping and being very openly supportive. But ultimately, the League would refuse to adopt uh, this measure. Um, and they ended up not allowing it to be further discussed or voted upon during the rest of the convention proceedings. So after the convention en ended, Dennett uh, went home and she ended up writing about 90 letters to various delegates um, at the League of Women Voters criticizing this decision and asking them to openly support um, the VPL's fight in Congress to remove the birth control clause from the federal comp Stock Act. Um, and she writes very, very clearly, I understand the unwillingness of the leaders of the National League of Women Voters to encourage um, organizational approval of this subject. The reason seems to be that it might antagonize the Catholic members, that it might menace the passage of the Shepherd Towner bill, which was a bill that would ultimately um, fund, uh, funnel public health funding um, for maternal and child health, um, particularly in rural, rural areas. Um, and that all, she wrote that it also might queer the organization and make it misunderstood, make the uh, LWV uh, misunderstood by the public. But she made this very strong argument to the League of Women Voters members saying that um, this is the very basis of child welfare um, and that the service that eventually would be provided, this maternal 
um, and child health uh, programming that was going to be provided that the league members were working so hard um, to get Congress to pass. It was going to be incomplete if um, you know, if if we if the, the the public health nurses and the physicians going into um, these areas don't teach women how to regulate and space their births by using uh, contraception, so she and she kind of tried to shame them into this. She said, um, "I understand, you know, or you all should understand that you are you all are white and privileged and wealthy. Most of you, you're sophisticated. You guys can get birth control. What we need to do is be advocating." For this so that um, women who aren't like you can access uh, birth control. And she did kind of use this phrasing of the great mass of poor and ignorant women, um, you know, but uh, she was appealing to these to this these women's uh, sensibility in attempting to get them to support uh, birth control. So some league members did share um, Dennett's view and, Mar and the views of Margaret Sanger, at least to an extent. Um, so there was, for example, a committee um, that was working on uh, trying to get uh, state laws to be more uniform in terms of women's rights, and it was called the, the Committee on Uniform Laws Concerning Women. And in their draft report, in which they were reporting on marriage and divorce laws, um, they argued, and there, this clause was actually in there, that there should be a measure or a law that would allow the establishment of public clinics for the dissemination of information to married people concerning contraceptives. And we should repeal the laws that make uh, the giving of such information a, a felony. And the, the committee actually comments, we realize that there is much opposition to this work and that the efforts of Mrs. Margaret Sanger seem to have been fruitless and followed by prison sentences, but at least she has called the attention of the public to the need of such work. Perhaps this is not the correct way or the best way to prevent compulsory motherhood, but one only has to stop and think of the poor mothers who were worn out before their time with the bearing and caring of too many children to realize that something must be done. Surely the nation and the race would be better off with fewer, better, and healthier babies. Why should not the law lead in reform? So, ironically, right after this uh, sort of section in the committee report, the league also recommended that in each state, uh, league women attorneys who were members should be agitating for legislative passage of marriage, marriage restrictions in the interest of eugenics, as well as be lobbying for laws that would uh, provide for the sterilization of defectives and epileptics. Subsequent drafts of the report would then strike out the paragraphs concerning birth control and they would leave only the recommendations on sterilization. So then um, the final uh, statement would read, laws should provide for the sterilization of defectives and epileptics by the state so they would be prevented from reproducing their kind to become a burden upon the state in after years. Um, and that version was what eventually was published in the League newspaper um, called The Woman Citizen. So as late as 1928, um, Margaret Sanger continued to lobby the League of Women Voters and their citizenship program to include birth control. Um, again, this was to, to really no avail. Um, and the, the way that the League kind of responded to that was uh, birth control, even as a study subject, lost out again after a fine array of arguments on both sides. Proponents wanted it linked with the sterilization of the unfit, which was adopted, for the study of measures to reduce degeneracy. Opponents objected to the crowding of a citizenship program with another so social subject of so controversial in na a nature. So that was the sort of situation uh, up through the late 1920s. Um, many suffragists and social reformers were continuing to take their fellow suffragists uh, to task um, about this rejection of birth control. And this was particularly true um, in the black community. So some black suffragists like Angela Weld, uh, Weld Grimke, she was working with Margaret Sanger to publicize birth control methods, methods in the black community. Uh, in 19, as early as 1918, the Women's Political Association of Harlem 
uh, began scheduling lectures on the need for birth control, and black newspaper editors wrote editorials supportive of legalizing it because they saw it as allowing for improvement in ne very necessary improvements in black women's lives. So for black birth control reformers, um, the support that they were offering to birth control was necessarily intersectional um, in the same way that the, the that black suffragists spoke about the vote. Um, birth control and suffrage would be used as a tool to mitigate um, the impacts of a racist and exclusionary society. And um, it goes far beyond legalizing birth control or um, passing the 19th Amendment for um, these reformers. Um, they see these as tools to accomplish much larger uh, uh, goals of eliminating uh, racism and inequality, uh, racial inequality in American society. White suffragists also um, take some of their fellow suffragists to task about this. It wasn't just Mary Ware Dennett, it was um, other folks like Crystal Eastman. Um, and they were very, very open that um, birth control should be part, a fundamental part of the feminist program. So for example, Eastman would write, um, I'm continually astonished at how distinguished feminists who discuss for an hour what could be done with the woman's vote do not once mention birth control. And she urged other women, whether, quote, whether we are the special followers of Alice Paul or Ruth Law or Ellen Key or Olive Schreiner, we all must be followers of Margaret Sanger. And as Margaret Sanger herself would put it, I have a quote here from 1920, but you'll see her express this kind of sentiment over and over again throughout the 1920s. Um, suffrage has not yet lived up to the promises made for it. She wrote, we promised when we sought the ballot that we would make use of it to apply fundamental remedies to the evils which exist all about us. And now that the ballot has been placed in our hands, even those who are most active in politics seem to have forgotten this promise. Um, and again, she is she is talking to um, suffragists about this, um, just as Crystal, Crystal Eastman is, and just as Mary Ware Dennett is. Um, and Dennett, in particular, continually remind likes to continually continually remind her fellow suffragists that um, you know you all privately believe in legal birth control. What you need to do is put this in the public arena, and you should speak out. And she the phrase she used was speak out in justice and in sympathy for the millions of parents who are now battling with poverty and ignorance and uh, help remove the law which bears heavily upon them and only lightly, if at all, on you. Um, instead of heeding these calls, however, um, local and national suffrage and women uh, suffrage organizations and women's clubs um, including the League of Women Voters, as we saw, uh, continue to focus their energies on working for progressive, quote unquote, social hygiene measures, including encouraging uh, state legislatures to adopt anti-prostitution measures, venereal disease ordinances, um, and laws that would very closely govern uh, delinquents, minors, and defectives. And again, the backdrop for that sort of agenda is uh, the eugenics, the popular eugenics movement, um, which attempted um, and, and promised that it could solve the problems of immigration, crime, uh, degeneracy, disease through the study of heredity. And so eugenics, uh, beginning in around the World War I period and into the 1920s, begin to, begins to sort of transform itself into um, a negative eugenic program in which um, the, the point is to stop the breeding of, un, of unfit people rather than encourage uh, certain kinds of marriages. So we begin to see that transformation and women's clubs and suffrage organizations are responding to that. So um, that sort of transition as the eugenics movement professionalizes and becomes aligns, aligned with these questions of state control, um, the birth control movement mirrors uh, what other women's groups are asking for in their agendas. And, and they openly align birth control with the idea of eugenic fitness and public health and medicine and not women's rights. And I can say more about this in the, in the Q&A. But um, by the late 1920s, uh, quote, middle class matrons, um, the same women who are members of the League of Women Voters and, and you know, other um, women's clubs were, join, were eventually joining um, the American Birth Control League by 
by the thousands. The ABCL, ABCL leadership was really conscious of the success um, and with volunteers noting that they had now reached, quote unquote, the best type of woman, um, those who are active in the Mother's Club and the League of Women Voters. And they're the, they're the women who are deeply interested in the subject of birth control and who will be very active and influential in the substantial conservative circles um, in order to bring birth control uh, to, to everyone. Um, so although they stopped short of directly endorsing compulsory sterilization, the ABCL, the American Birth Control League, uh, which had been founded by Margaret Sanger in 1921, um, they continued to openly promote um, a program of negative eugenics or restricting, again, the fertility of those who are unfit, the, the mentally or physically disabled or um, people of color uh, through birth control. So this, kind of language and framing has the effect of basically removing birth control from the sort of like more radical socialist uh, feminist ideals, breaking the association that it had um, in, in whatever way it did have with, with free love um, and voluntary motherhood, um, and instead making it acceptable to Americans uh, based on the basis of, of medical practicality. Um, its implication for public health and um, the implications for racial and family fitness. Um, and so suffrage and women's club activism after the passage of the, of the 19th Amendment, they, they're they not directly responsible to create in, in creating or shaping the birth control movement's uh, response and shift in this direction. Rather, um, what I'm saying is the birth control movement driven mostly by white women um, and white physicians was simply mirroring uh, the the other similar agendas of other reform groups in the early um, part of this of the century, all of which are concerned um, with fixing the social problems caused by um, immigration, urbanization, labor, and capital. So rather than thinking about um, and this is sort of my, my final point, and I'm going to wrap up here. Um, rather than thinking about suffrage and birth control as these liberal feminist movements, we have to take into account these complexities and these transformations that they undergo over time and think about how multiple things can be true at the same time, right? So similar to the suffrage movement, sort of open commitment, very open commitment um, to elevating the vote only for, for white women, um, birth control in the early 20th century uh, be also became associated with a broader restrictive agenda um, that promised to maintain you know, white power, white supremacy, and eliminate the unfit, whether because of disability or race or national origin. And there are those who present alternatives to this vision, um, namely Mary Ware Dunnett in particular, who is sort of Margaret Sanger's rival in the early birth control movement. She rejects those kinds of associations with birth control. Um, and certainly Black reformers who were viewing birth control uh, as, a, as something that would have much more radical uh, potential. Um, to eliminate inequality. Um, and of course, there were many women, white and of color, who on an individual level knew and experienced exactly what free access to contraception meant in terms of controlling their own futures. Um, this and that sort of revolutionary experience and thinking is not diminished um, if we examine these other histories and genealogies of birth control. The problem is that a lot of this complexity has been flattened in kind of our standard histories of women's rights. And today um, you often see kind of this uncritical celebration of uh, the past where we treat women's rights as a sort of this like straight and untroubled path toward equality um, in which these kind of more contentious racial um, and eugenic issues have played no part. Um, the other kind of piece to this though is that anti-abortion and um, conservative activists have certainly picked up on these tensions and they have been focusing recently um, and very intensely on the legacies of eugenics and racism um, as another plank in their arguments to argue today that this is why um, we should restrict reproductive rights for, for all women. So, um, you know, I think we can leave it here. You know, both arguments restrict uh, 
uh, or, or sorry, ignore or misunderstand uh, the transformations and the continuities in the history of reproductive politics and and the American and American feminist reform more broadly. Um, you know, it's it's true on the one hand that the notion um, that women had the right to own themselves you know, was and, and is one of the founding pillars of, um, the, of conceptions of female citizenship. But in order to better uh, define and understand um, how female citizenship operates now for all women in this country, we have to grapple with these not always comfortable legacies. So thank you all so much for listening to this presentation. And um, I look forward to the question and answer session. Thank you. Great. Hello. So um, I am a political scientist, so I'm going to be talking uh, from social science perspective. Uh, but before I, uh, on, on some of those issues, not birth control necessarily, but suffragists and the initial agenda that um, they fostered and what the vote itself meant for the men's agenda after uh, the 19th Amendment. Um, uh, but before that, I want to say very, very quickly, thank you to the organizers for such a fabulous event. Just looking through the program, you have really done a terrific job uh, to compile a wonderful set of contributions for what I think is an absolutely timely event because it's been almost about 100 years ago. Um, um, uh, that was under years ago that that most women not obviously not all but most women were uh were voting for the first time uh in the us in the november 1920 election so very timely event as part of my contribution i want to talk about the immediate electoral impact of the first women voters um the representation of women's vo women voters and women's agendas after the vote because there is a lot written by both historians and social scientists on why and when women achieved the vote. Um, but actually much less has been systematically explored and especially by social scientists about the aftermath of the 19th Amendment um, or the aftermath of women's suffrage across the world in general. One of the questions that uh, Americanists uh, keep talking about but hasn't necessarily, have, has not necessarily been re resolved is how did the first women vote? which party or which issue or set of issue preferences were these women voted, voting on? Were they voting as their husbands? Um, did they mirror the man's vote or did they vote in a distinct way? And actually ample research suggests that women's preferences on women's agendas uh, or on certain issues were simple and distinct, but actually then estimating how exactly uh, the pool of women um, the electorate, the women electorate voted is not was not as is not as easy. is an incredibly difficult job, and the few studies that have tried to do that do not necessarily provide a clear answer uh, to that question. Um, most of the research actually suggests that the little research that there is that tries to estimate women's voting preferences suggests that the first women voted uh, did not vote differently than men, that they simply neither party benefited, and if so, the, the let's say, Republican or Democratic um, uh, uh, gains after uh, the 19 amendments were marginal and therefore uh, not so relevant. So why that is when we have a sense and there's a lot written on how women would have different preferences, different shared experiences, and as a result, distinct preferences on certain issues. The second puzzle that the literature really doesn't uh, yet have uh, answers for concerns women's turnout. So we know from sex separated data, that is election data that were collected separately for women and men, often by using different colored envelopes. Those type of data tells us, especially in Europe, but also in parts of the US, tells us exactly how women and men voted, uh, not, exact, not necessarily how, but most often um, how many women and men voted in a given, let's say, county or municipality. Uh, this type of data avoids this huge um, issue of uh, estimation, estimating women's preferences, because you know exactly from this type of data how many women and how many men voted in that municipality. And this data um, suggests 
that women systematically voted, the first women voters uh, voted systema at systematically lower rate than men. However, what this data also shows is that it varies massively across localities, meaning in some places women voted almost as much as men, and in other places women didn't vote uh, nearly uh, at all. Like what some of the estimates say, all well, 5% of women in the South voted, or in some states in the South voted um, in the 1920 election. So how, how, why is that? Why do we see such a great disparity in women's mobilization? Uh, we don't yet know, <laughs> uh, especially as social scientists when it comes to analyzing this data and trying to find that out. And the final question that I feel is really, again, looping, uh, looping and hasn't really been answered, especially by social scientists, is how did politicians respond to women's suffrage? So the how exactly um, were the first women uh, voters mobilized by politicians? Were they mobilized by distinct agendas or on agendas that were pretty much mirroring men's preferences? Um, and scholars often assume that politicians uh, appeal to women with distinct messages, promising to improve women's and children's lives, let's say, after suffrage. But then there's surprisingly little data to quantify which politicians responded this way with what messages. And this is all very relevant when we uh, can ask the ultimate questions of did women's representation actually improve with the vote? We do assume scholars uh, um, across the board assume that the vote is really a necessary uh, and sufficient condition often uh, to improve representation. As long as the newly enfranchised groups, in this case newly enfranchised women uh, in the US get their vote, uh, the preferences, their shared preferences will be better represented. But is it really the case? Um, um, because it is possible that women may have behaved at the polls the same way as men. Or it is also possible, as others have suggested, that women did not have enough capacity as first women, as first voters, or enough interests, or even enough knowledge to vote independently on those shared agendas, as you know, some anti-suffragist arguments would imply and some scholars uh, over the years have suggested. And so then, if that's the case, if women really behave at the polls similarly to men, then why we need to ask, why would politicians actually need to change anything after suffrage? Why would they need to respond and adopt uh, uh, agenda that's specific uh, to women or improves women's and children's lives or uh, improves women's representation in general? So in this case, what I call de jure suffrage, that is granting women access to the polls, actually would not translate into what we can think of as de facto suffrage that is improved women's representation or improved representation of women. So in the work um, I have published in the Journal of Politics um, and is now being extended into a comparative book that looks at Norway, Chile and the United States and is funded by the Research Council in the UK, which is the equivalent of the NSF in the UK. Um, in this work, I suggest that really tracing the roots of women's representation after suffrage needs to start with electoral process. If we assume that politicians primarily seek a re-election, which is most political scientists assume that, then uh, the politicians will have uh, incentive to respond to women's uh, distinct preferences and represent those after suffrage. However, they will only do so if women will vote on these preferences. If women don't care about education and maternity spending and veterans pensions or other issues, um, then why would politicians bring uh, maternity spending, uh, improve maternity spending, for example, on the agenda? Why would they uh, represent women's, shared women's preferences? Um, uh, if women themselves do not coordinate electorally on those preferences. And here is the catch. Um, because mostly when you think about it in terms of general newly enfranchised groups, they do have um, typically shared experience of historical marginalization, whether this is because of shared gender, class or race. Uh, and this shared experience, uh, this, this shared experience may give grounds to shared political preferences of the group. Uh, but those shared political preferences are generally masked by a substantial heterogeneity within the group in terms of characteristics and interests and even experiences amongst the members. 
of the group. And precisely because of this heterogeneity, this de jure inclusion of a historical marginalized group may not result in a coordinated effort by that group uh, at the polls to demand uh, de facto representation of those shared interests. And this would seem particularly likely in the case of women upon enfranchisement. Um, uh, and this is, again, general, uh, both in the US and in other cases, where women are typically a heterogeneous and large group that historically, uh, after suffrage, would have lacked access to political resources and would have faced strong, let's say, anti-participatory social norms. So, for example, women may prefer social reform and the protection of women and children as a shared preference as a group, but may not know how their representative voted, may not vote, may not be interested in the vote, um, or uh, may not uh, may not uh, directly prefer to vote on these issues. Maybe even if they prefer maternity spending, they actually end up voting on household maternity benefits um, rather than on women's shared interests as a group. So in that in the work of mine, I then think about okay under what circumstances or when and how do these shared group preferences of an otherwise very heterogeneous and possibly inexperienced electorate after the vote form and translate into sufficiently coordinated electoral force that fosters policy change in favor of that group. And the answer I suggest in my work lies in social movements, and in this case, particularly the suffragists. And finally, I'm getting to the core um, of my argument, um, because it's the social movements that enable the group electoral coordination on shared interests and opens up, therefore, this pathway to improved group representation. OK, how exactly this is done? How exactly do social movements, how exactly did suffragists help to coordinate the first women voters on shared preferences at the polls? to improve their representation after the, board, after the vote. And I suggest this is in two main ways. So the first is that social movements or suffragists in particular uh, define what these shared preferences are and then they raise consciousness of these collective preferences. So think of the National Americans Women's Suffrage Association. So even though this is an organization that was nonpartisan for strategic reason, this nonpartisanship really did not imply that they were neutral when it came to women's broader policy agenda. And Lauren has set it up very clearly um, as she spoke about birth control, but also other agenda. So the agenda, so the organization, in fact, was, while formally nonpartisan, was uh, embedded in this progressive agenda in general. Um, of course, we are here talking about white, native-born, middle-class uh, progressive agenda, but um, it is it is it is an agenda that was then defined as uh, women's uh, women's preferences or agenda that was of specific specific issue uh, specific interest to women. So while this progressive agenda was secondary to the suffrage cause uh, for for suffragists, uh, the progressive focus or at least some policy progressive focus was welcomed by the organization. So for example, we know that um, the national uh, the NASA collected information on progressive bills and published analyses of the bill's effects of these if interests were bills you know not only that referred to women and children but also included these broadly progressive laws on industrial incidents referenda prohibition uh health various health measures public schools or workman compensation so all this work by suffragists uh really helped to define what issues were specific to women's interests and help to raise women's consciousness of these issues as shared and relevant to women. And so that's the first thing that you need for women to even be able to coordinate electorally or shared issues, demand those issues from politicians and therefore eventually get electoral representation um, or get improved uh, policy representation through the electoral process. And then the second thing that uh, social movements um, uh, can do in fostering this process of representation after the suffrage is that they uh, inform, they provide information, uh, especially information about, let's say, politicians' position on relevant issues. So if newly enfranchised groups in general, like experience with the political process, as you would expect, because you have been historically marginalized and excluded from the process, you did not develop a voting habit or you have faced rigid social norms, then in that case, the strong, strong social, strong active social movements may help to overcome uh, this challenge. 
So again, let's think about the suffragists in the U.S. The uh, uh, while the NAFSA's headquarters led the national campaign, the activities of state organizations, on the other hand, were more locally focused and included things such as monitoring of state representatives or organizing statewide collective actions such as parades or uh, demonstrations. So for example, the suffrage demonstrations were especially likely to endorse negative campaigns against conservative legislative activities. That's uh, really what the data I have collected on suffrage demonstrations show in the US very clearly. And then finally, at the local level, the local suffragists across the country, then they were instructed by the national headquarters to really aim at contacting non-members in person um, they educated women in what we know as citizenship classes on political registration matters, and they tried to inform women about incumbents' legislative activities through various uh, types of these activities. In fact, the goal of these so-called helpers of pressing captains within the local suffragists hierarchy was to reach out to every voter in their section at least once a month, uh, to read and distribute the suffragist literature that was provided and to record views on suffrage of all voters and non-voters. So while all of these activities, while neither of these activities of suffragists would have provided direct instructions of women on how to vote, the mere exposure of suffragists uh, to suffragists would have increased women's information um, about what is women's agenda um, and uh, about politicians' position on women's agenda, uh, especially in the past, and then would directly encourage registration, meaning mobilization of these women. And the evidence I provide in my work is exactly consistent with the relevance of suffragists for women's electoral coordination on shared interests. So in particularly what I show, by estimating women's uh, women's uh, electoral preferences in the 1920 election and then further, I estimated these newly enfranchised women punished non-conservative, not pro conservative, or you can think of them as non-progressive politicians, but they did only uh, coordinate electorally uh, against these conservative politicians in states where suffragists were strongest in numbers, where suffragists were most active, which leads us to uh, believe that the role of suffragists in women's representation would have been important for those two reasons, both defining women's issues and then mobilizing women's issues on that. So what does all of this tell us? Uh, why is all of this important? <laughs> and I want to mention three final points, um, especially how this argument uh, and the evidence I provide for that uh, relates to previous research. So one thing that this role of suffragists uh, demonstrates is the importance of assessing electoral impact of women's suffrage based on issues, not based on parties, because most of the previous literature, uh, especially political scientists or social scientists who estimated women's political preferences, uh, in the first few election after suffrage would have just been thinking about was there a national swing towards Republicans? Was there a national swing towards Democrats? Um, but actually what we need to do, um, as I demonstrate in my work is, and I have just um, uh, talked you through, is we need to really be estimating women's preferences on issues at the district level because those would have been nonpartisan. So it's not a necessarily a question of whether women swayed towards the Republican or Democrats, but it's a question of whether the conservatives within the Democratic Party or the conservatives within the uh, uh, Republican Party were, let's say, punished? And if so, whether that then fostered progressive shifts in Congress after the vote and therefore enforced uh, or uh, helped women's party, uh, representation after the vote. And it can really, by shifting the, the way we think about women's electoral impact from parties to issues, we can really be resolving or providing an explanation for why we have the sense that women's preferences would have been very distinct. But actually most um, research suggests that women did not vote as a bloc, so that there was not a, sing that there was not a big sway towards one party or the other. Um, um, the other um, implication that I think is very important uh, to think about is that um, by showing that, let's say, these conservatives have, lo have lost votes because of the addition of new women voters in the states that uh, suffragists were uh, very active, uh, this finding challenges really the conventional narrative of women as being either uninterested voters who doubled the votes of their husbands 
or as conservative elements who just moved left only when outside employment became the more norm from 1950s, uh, 1970s onward. Um, if newly, even if it is the case that newly enfranchised women lack resources uh, to engage politically in the electoral arena to the same extent as men, as uh, many have suggested, organized women would have helped to bring more knowledgeable women to the polls who could then vote on uh, shared interests, in this case, progressive interests after the 19th Amendment. And finally, again, my final point, this finding um, of the importance of suffrages for women's electoral uh, in, uh, coordination after the vote shows the importance of women's mobilization um, by the organized women's groups for really sustaining women's policy agenda. So this, uh, the, the leak of women voters really, um, when they stopped mobilizing women voters, uh, is it's really coinciding with when women's agenda in Congress declined. And so uh, it may very well be that one reason for why women's agenda temporarily died off uh, after the 19th Amendment from the mid-1950s onward, for example, uh, 1920s onward, was really that uh, the League of Women Voters or uh, these women's groups uh, lost track um, of mobilizing these women and helping and easing their electoral coordination. And it really shows and makes us to think that unless women's groups are strong and mobilize women on these issues, on, on women's shared issues, we may well end up in the situation where this de jure suffrage does not translate to better representation. And this is an implication that has huge policy implication when it comes to suffrage agenda um, uh, or uh, representation of marginalized groups in general, um, even though I have explored specifically the case of the 19th Amendment. And I will stop here and I look forward to questions in the Q&A. All right, thank you all. So I'm gonna to begin to share my screen. I'm going to do the main presentation and Allie's going to clean up any of the errors that I make later on. Much like we write our papers, I take the first stab at this and then she comes in and she fixes all of the errors that exist. So let me bring up this PowerPoint for you here. One, one second, my apologies. No. Okay. You should be able to see my slides, correct? Uh, you can make them bigger if you want. Uh, right now we see the whole, there you go. Perfect. Right, now we're seeing presenter view, Adam. Thank you. Yes, I appreciate. So the, top, the title of our, our paper and the subject that we're going to be talking about today is Agendas After Suffrage, Women's Association's Responses to the Vote, 1915 to 1925. So this actually relates, I think, very well to Mona's paper. And so hopefully this will be Adam? Uh, my co-author, who's the master of the PowerPoint, uh, has temporarily lost his connection. Um, in the case that he's not able to come back, um, I am currently working to get a copy of the presentation up on my end, um, and or he will be rejoining us as soon as possible. 
All right. Um, until Adam can rejoin us, um, I'll resume where Adam left off, um, which is talking about um, our research, which is focusing on um, women's groups' agendas before and after suffrage, um, looking at the five-year period um, before and after the ratification of the 19th Amendment from 1915 to 1925. But, um, so this project fits within Adam and I's broader research agenda. Um, we've investigated a host of issues related to large federated voluntary associations, be that women's groups or um, just general associations um, from 1875 to 1920. Um, in particular, Adam has done a lot of work and data collection on the Women's Christian Temperance Union, and I've done a good deal of work on the General Federation of Women's Clubs, and we've brought those insights together um, with other information on a variety of voluntary, often federated associations. So, um, and we've been thinking um, on the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, um, just what suffrage meant to these associations, not only women's groups, but um, groups like, for example, the Grange um, or the labor unions that were not primarily women's groups. So for example, things like the Railroad Brotherhoods um, or corporate organizations like the American Bankers Association. Um, how did suffrage help to transform the agendas of these groups as well? For the purposes of today's uh, conversation, we're going to focus obviously on uh, the agendas of women's groups and the effects of suffrage on women's associations. So, Specifically, we're going to ask uh, how suffrage affected these associations' policy agendas. Um, today, we'll be looking specifically, as future slides will detail, at uh, the three largest women's groups of the era. So um, while I acknowledge there was a large coalition working for women's rights, um, and you've probably, many of you, seen the diagrams of all of the interconnected women's organizations during this period. Um, we're going to focus on the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the General Federation of Women's Clubs, and the National Women's Suffrage or National American Women's Suffrage Association. I'm sorry, um, all of which were at one point in time the largest women's group in the country. Um, we're going to look specifically at um, how the 19th Amendment affected how associations organized their departments of work. So each of these organizations had departments or committees, and you heard Lauren talk a little bit about those earlier. Um, and we're going to focus on that with specific reference um, to these three groups um, using their archival records. Um, and of course, many of these women's associations um, were known for an issue or issues that were at the center of their agenda, um, but they were often active and well-organized in a variety of different policy issues, as some of the information I'll present today will begin to show you. Um, so, uh, just to give you a little bit of background, um, the development of organizations uh, began in the antebellum era. Um, uh, obviously, um, women were active in organizations related to abolition, um, related to education, related to revivalism, related to temperance, even before the Civil War. Um, the Civil War catalyzed women into uh, uh, memorial organizations, working as nurses, um, patriotic groups, um, providing for the war effort, um, as well as um, uh, organizations after the war helping with the commemoration and the recovery. And this was prominent both in the Union um, with organizations um, like the Women's Auxiliary of the General Army of the Republic. Public Women's Relief Corps, as well as in the Confederacy with the United Daughters of the Confederacy, um, a group that you may best know for their monument construction efforts. And Adam and I have done some work um, on that group specifically as well. Um, 
And the post-war era, post-Civil War era, was very important for the organization of groups of all kinds because it was the centerpiece of an era marked by rapid modernization, improvement in transportation and communication technology. Um, and it facilitated the group uh, the growth of federated voluntary associations across the country. It allowed organizations to have centralized offices in Washington, D.C. or another major city and also have state headquarters and local headquarters and come together often with the sponsorship of the newly organized railroad corporations um, to have annual conferences. And this really had been much more difficult in the pre-Civil War era. So it led to much more cohesive, coordinated efforts, um, which were also facilitated um, by the lack of professionalization present in legislatures at this point in time. Uh, they had small staffs. They didn't have much by way of resources. So voluntary associations provided a really important subsidy for legislatures and thus played an important role in the policy process. That, and of course, probably two of the biggest landmarks of group successes, particularly women's group successes, during this period were the ratification of the 18th Prohibition Amendment and the 19th Amendment. Um, during the battle for the 19th Amendment, um, as has been widely discussed elsewhere, um, uh, suffrage played a key role uh, role in uniting otherwise disparate women's organizations, bringing together groups like the Women's Trade Union League, the National Consumers League, the groups that we study here, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, um, with the National American Women's Suffrage Association, which was notoriously disorganized and struggled to really get its act together. Um, in fact, many of the women who led the National American Women's Suffrage Association um, during the successful push to the 19th Amendment had actually um, been trained in and were active members in other better organized women's groups like the Women's Christian Temperance Union and the General Federation of Women's Clubs. And that allowed it um, to build key coalitions necessary to show the widespread appeal, although certainly not universal, as Mona's work touched on earlier, um, for um, women and the potential effects for society, as well as to help mobilize women nationwide, mobilize men nationwide, mobilize legislatures, um, work on campaigns and um, lobby both directly to the government through organizations like the NW, NAWSA's uh, Congressional Committee, as well as um, through more informal methods like those used by the NWP, uh, the National Women's Party, which was formed later. Um, so in short, right, uh, the very fact that the 19th Amendment becomes ratified is evidence that, that these organizations were well equipped, they were politically savvy, um, they had gotten the adoption of the 18th Amendment, they've gotten the approval of many progressive reforms like protectionist legislation for women, they had allies in local, state, and national government, they were very much institutionalized by the time that we were going in to the battle for suffrage. Um, so that led Adam and I to ask a question, right? If these groups were institutionalized and had already won policy successes, how much did the 19th Amendment actually change? Shim? Right? It's possible that the 19th Amendment changed a lot because groups could totally overhaul how they focused on policy issues. They could mobilize massive groups of citizens through outreach, like Mona discussed. Um, or on the other hand, uh, um, it's possible that they were already so institutionalized and had achieved so much policy success and built up such core constituencies that with the possible exception of the newly formed slash evolving League of Women Voters, which comes out of NAWSA, uh, that um, maybe there wasn't a whole lot of reason for change. Maybe suffrage was just another tool um, in the toolkit and the policy agendas moved forward largely um, uh, without fluctuation, 
so as I've said before, we look at um, three groups uh, as our key illustration. Our goal would eventually be to broaden this, but for the purposes of manageability, particularly in a time of difficult archival access, we focus on these three largest women's groups. Um, and the WCTU and GFWC both encompass large policy agendas. Um, the WCTU was older, right? It was formed in 1874. Um, the GFWC was formed in 1890, but that was formed out of an association of existing women's clubs with a variety of different dates of establishment. Um, and of course, NAWSA was the merger of the National Women's Suffrage Association and the American Women's Suffrage Association, um, which were formed in the wake of the ratification of the Civil War Amendments in the 1870s. Um, so all of these groups had rich histories by the time that we even begin to study. Um, we primarily study annual and biennial reports. So these are the reports that were published out of groups conferences. Um, and um, we focus on their departments of work and presidential addresses. Um, for, G or for WCTU and NAWSA, that means we have roughly 11 annual reports. Uh, GFWC met biennially, so we have fewer individual record points for GFWC. We've tried to get some of their magazines in supplement, but unfortunately their libraries and archives um, are currently not accessible to the public, so we've run into some obstacles there, but we're working on it, Tim. Um, to give you a short sense of what we found through combing through these documents, um, we found that um, before suffrage, right, so if we start looking in 1915, um, there wasn't a lot of change for the Women's Christian Temperance Union. It was relatively stable in the lead up to suffrage, which also means, it, in, interestingly enough, that it was relatively stable in the lead up to the ratification of the Prohibition Amendment, which was ratified at roughly the same time. Um, in anticipation of the adoption of the 19th Amendment, the WCTU did um, end its suffrage department in 1919, merging it as part of Christian citizenship, um, which would very much, again, be consistent with some of the civic outreach efforts that Mona discussed earlier. Um, for the GFWC, the departments remained consistent up until 1920. But in 1920, big changes happened for the GFWC. Not only could its members vote for the first time, um, but also it finally achieved its goal of getting a headquarters in Washington, D.C. Um, and it is the same building where it is headquartered today. It's on DuPont Circle um, or just off DuPont Circle. Um, and so that very much changed the GFWC strategies because now they were D.C. based. Uh, um, and so it very much increased their emphasis on lobbying Congress uh, in addition to the states. So it's very difficult with regard to the GFWC to say that those changes were solely the result of suffrage because likely uh, their location had a significant effect as well. Um, NAWSA um, began to focus on uh, suffrage as well as other issues. Um, related to women's organizations, and that lays the groundwork for after suffrage um, when the League of Women Voters um, it, uh, is one of the key organizations in forming the Women's Joint Congressional Committee. And this provides a clearinghouse for women's associations. Uh, um, and basically, it functions as an organization that operates on consensus. If five member groups agree with the policy issue, the Women's Joint Congressional Committee also puts re its resources behind it. Of course, um, this coalition, which came out of suffrage, uh, very quickly came to find that other than giving women the right to vote, uh, there wasn't a lot that necessarily united all of these women's groups, at least in terms of how to approach the issues. They may have agreed what issues were important, but they had different perspectives on them. Uh, so the Women's Joint Congressional Committee 
while it achieves some key successes, including Shepard Towner, which we talked about earlier, um, it is relatively short-lived and its influence is basically nil by 1930. And part of that also has to do with suffrage, I'm sorry, with uh, accusations of socialism. Um, and uh, as Lauren nicely talked about earlier, conflicts over birth control. Um, but for our three key groups, um, really the evidence suggests very little change. Um, the WCTU doesn't really change its departments at all. The GFWC streamlines its departments, but it doesn't really get rid of issues. It just kind of combines them. So where in the past it might have had separate committees for health, labor, and pensions, now we get the Health, Labor, and Pensions Committee with subcommittees. Um, so uh, it was a consolidation of effort, but not a shift in agenda. Um, and again, some of that was likely attributable to the DC headquarters. Um, the League of Women Voters draws a lot on what other women's groups are doing, but um, really emphasizes this civic education function, which extends directly from suffrage. Um, beyond a new goal of educating women and trying to get non-member women to the polls, as Mona talked about, um, these groups didn't change their key policy issues or even how they talked about those key policy issues. Um, very much suffrage was another tool in the toolkit. One exception to that for all of the groups is that all the groups took a greater interest in Americanization. Um, and this was an issue that the WCTU and GFWC had thought about previously. Um, but it became increasingly emphasized in the early 1920s. Um, likely though, this wasn't even really the result of suffrage, but the result of increasing global isol isolationism and an increasing emphasis on nationalism in the wake of World War II, I'm sorry, World War I, um, which is um, certainly an important intervention that happens during this period as well. Um, and in fact, changing the label to Americanization um, reflects those ideas as well. Uh, so what can we conclude? Uh, well, we can conclude so far, at least based on what we've seen, that the 19th Amendment didn't alter the policy agendas. It may have altered how they achieved those agendas, um, moving away from petitions towards educating voters, for example. Um, but um, it didn't really shift the goals of these groups. It was another toolbox in the arsenal. Um, and as a result, we argue that the limited changes in groups' policy agendas during this period really underscore how institutionalized and politicized women's groups were in the early part of the 20th century, even before the right to vote. Um, so actually, we would argue that the right to vote was achieved because women's groups were institutionalized, professionalized, and successful, not that the right to vote made women's groups those things, right? Um, so the, the causal arrow very much um, requires women's groups to be organized um, and effective, again, echoing Mona's findings quite a lot, um, to achieving that goal. Uh, so I'll stop there in the interest of questions and because nobody likes listening to me for that long. Um, and uh, I look forward to having a conversation with y'all. Thanks, Allie. And I'm so sorry that we lost Adam. Um, I, I have my phone next to me and I haven't gotten a message from him, so I don't know, but I'll hold down the fort. We're good. Okay, no, you did. That was great when you weren't planning to talk the whole time. That was <laughs> nicely handled and we appreciate it. Um, so I'm not going to talk for very long at all um, as the moderator because I want to give a little bit of time for people who are watching us to ask some questions. But I was struck both in reading what you guys sent me and especially in listening to the three of you by the the consistencies and the common themes we can see here right especially Allie, when you talked about that they're shifting to americanization in the 1920s really echoing what lauren was talking about in terms of this increasing emphasis on things like 
uh, eugenics and the League of Women Voters adopting a sterilization, you know, policy and things like that. Like there's a very conservative, you know, there's there's a very conservative sort of movement happening here among these groups. Um, and then Mona and Ali, you know, and Ali was doing a great job of sort of riffing off of, of what you had said, Mona, and I'm going to I'm going to riff off of what you said when I start my my own research presentation in the in our midday session because um, it's fascinating for me. But the impact of organizing, right? Who's organizing? What at what level are they organizing? Because I think y'all are talking about very different levels. Mona, you took us really nicely down into like at the local, you know, the local chapter, local precinct chapter. You're supposed to be going out and doing this and that. Um, so sort of who's organizing and how that then relates to how we measure. Things like Adam's back. Welcome, Adam. Yes, okay. <laughs> I held on the fort. We're good. You did great. You did great. <laughs> Nobody wanted to listen to me. <laughs> um, but um, but you know, Mona and Ali putting your papers together and thinking about how where we look and measure things determines how we determine success, right? Like like Mona, if you're looking at sort of voter mobilization and that that's the goal for these local levels, then that's a very different picture of success than looking for big changes that come with the 19th Amendment or not um, that Ali and Adam are looking at. Um, so I just think there's all sorts of interesting ways that these fit together. Um, like I said, I'm going to, I was furiously taking notes while the political scientists were talking because as a historian, that's the fun part for me. That's the part I do get very often. Um, but we've got about 10 minutes-ish left in the session. So I do want to open it up. Anyone who's watching, you can just put a comment in, whether you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube, you can just put in a comment. Uh, and that will, uh, we can pull that up. If you've got a question, just let us know and our panelists would be happy to answer any questions. Or Mabin, if you have a question, you can ask too. I think someone put a, a question in the comments. There was me. one for you up earlier, yeah. Yes, um, where does birth control further the Here suffrage is. movement? What was the argument that one helped the other? Okay, so this is that's actually a really good question because I think that the suffragists would say birth control does not help us get away, right? Um, but the and then the birth control movement they obviously want the suffragist endorsement because the suffragist movement it has such an emphasis on this like these like respectability politics and we're reaching the best kind of women. Um, but um, I also think that it's important to know that I think that the birth control movement would have proceeded along the lines that it did, even if the suffrage movement hadn't ever said like a word to it. Um, I think that the the climate of progressivism and the emphasis on Americanization and all of the social and political issues that were swirling around in the early part of the century what they were it was going to influence the direction of the movement um no matter what so i mean my 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 argument is is that the suffrage and birth control movements could sort of arrive at like they have similar arguments that they're making about the reasoning for either the vote or birth control and they're relying on um kind of making these arguments that you know the, the, these things will in the end uphold white supremacy i mean we know from the, the recent research being done by Martha Jones and um, Kathleen Cahill. And I mean, w suffragists and um, f people of color were looking at the vote in a much different way than white women were. So, um, and I think this, we can we can say the same about, about birth control. Now, not all of them, not everybody, and especially not Mary Ware Dunnett, who I'm writing my book about, but um, in the end, you know, the, the trajectory of the of that movement um, is very specific, right? And it's it 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 has a, a complicated legacy, the same way that the suffrage movement does as well. So, thanks. We have no other questions yet. I was impressed at how synthesized our papers were. Yeah, no, this this held together really nicely. So yes, you guys feel free to ask each other questions since we don't have any from the group. If you guys have, we got like five minutes. If you guys have, wanna wanna ask each other anything, go right ahead. 
I'm going to be really curious, um, Mona in particular, to see, and I know it's going to be late where you are, so you may or may not stay. If I may send you my paper just because I'm, I'm really going to be talking about the parties taking over this role of organizing women at the local level in the middle of the century um, through their women's divisions. That's what I'm sort of working on and researching. And so it was really interesting. Everything you were talking about, I was like, wait, but the parties are doing this in the 40s and 50s. Um, it's sort of the women's organizations go away and the parties are doing it in the 40s and 50s. And that's, yeah, you and I are going to talk some more. <laughs> definitely. I mean, what you're saying is really fantastic. Um, I definitely want to look at your work. Um, yeah, and we should follow up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh. Yeah, Mona, I was also interested in, um, correct me if I'm wrong, you said that you've collected in the U.S. The, um, community level voting data. So the, the, the evidence that I was referring to in my presentation today, that's based on estimates that's um, uh, uh, at the county level, pretty much. Okay. So, um, yeah, so it's- I'd be interested in how that maps on the organizational data that Adam and I have for where were these groups strong, where were their local chapters, that kind of thing, right? Was there a direct correlation? They say that was their strategy. Did that actually work? <laughs> Uh, yeah, absolutely. I was just thinking about the data that you have collected, and I think there is a lot of overlap between our work. So yeah, we should also keep <laughs> connected. And do you have do you have a paper? Do you have this all written up that I could look that I could uh, that you could share with me? Or when it when it's done, we have work. <laughs> they are not complete, <laughs> but they are thoughts, and your feedback would probably be very helpful. <laughs> well. And we have another question that's come in for Mona about the sort of international aspect. Like, can you, there it is, Maven put it up for us. Um, sort of, can you give us a real quick rundown of like how this looks different if we look transnationally? Yeah, I mean, there are surprising similarities and of course you will find differences, right? So I look at Norway and then in Chile and compare that with US. And it's what, what is similar is that the suffrage organizations tend to do similar things, um, even though the exact women's agenda tends to vary. So, you know, the Chilean suffragists in the 50s would have been thinking about different things in terms of what's important to women. There is nonetheless a very common thread of maternity and childhood protection um, that you would find. And what is different, however, um, is how the strategy of suffragists varies, and that tends to be with what I think is mostly electoral system. So what you see in the uh, in the US, which is a single first past the post, single member plurality, then of course, you know, you will try to lobby that individual politician on that particular issue and mobilize women on you know around that. But in proportional representation, the suffragists cannot just you know, or coordinate or try to coordinate women or, or, or lobby politicians specifically, they go to parties, right? So there is much more of a of a partisan, uh, which party is going to support suffrage with which party we're going to coalesce, which you, in, whereas in the US it's more uh, individualized. And so I put that down to the electoral system. And the evidence for that is of course, cross-sectional um, uh, comparing those three cases, but I can also show that in the US, uh, sorry, in, the, in Norway, because Norway adopted PR shortly after women's suffrage. So you can see that uh, the strategy of suffragists and then women's behavior and policy agenda changes just before and just after the, the proportional representation. So that's, that's the wider book project really focusing on women's mobilization, women's representation, and how that's um, facilitated by suffrage movement within distinct uh, institutional frameworks. Really cool. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone who's watching. Thanks to our panelists. We are now going to take a lunch, brunch if you're on the West Coast, early dinner if you're Mona kind of break. <laughs> And we will be back. So this afternoon, right here at this this same, uh, I've got a four-year-old son, so my brain went to same bat time, same bat channel, um, right here. Um, we are going to be at 12.30 Central, and then uh, a short break, and then 2.15 Central for two more panels um, of the similar format. And then at 4 o'clock Central, we've got our keynote um, from Dr. Kristen Goss, um, who's a political scientist at Duke. Um, so we hope that you'll come back.
Um, we also hope that we had all of our like technical kinks worked out um, <laughs> in this morning session. We hope we don't, we, Adam, we're so sorry. Um, but, um, but yeah, thank you all very much for tuning in and hopefully we'll see everybody back here in an hour and a half. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.